O sea, tendría que haber humedales en cada drenaje, para mi gusto, ¿no? Tendría que haber humedales en cada banqueta, jardines comestibles en cada parque. O sea, el tema de la infraestructura verde está naciendo en la ciudad y al mismo tiempo estamos viendo el valor de tener a la naturaleza completamente entrelazada con la dinámica de la ciudad. Y, y en ese sentido es un gran logro y en el otro sentido es, es un gran reto, ¿no? Porque pues no es fácil. Hello, this is uh, John Thackera speaking to you from Garage with a dear friend of mine and a wonderful person called Elias Catan. He's an architect and urbanist and planner from Mexico City. And he's one of the people that's inspired me over many years about the different ways one could approach the subject of bringing rivers back to life in a city. And his main work has been around the world, but in Mexico City, which is one of the most spectacular sites in the world in terms of urbanism and watersheds coexisting together. Uh, uh, welcome, uh, Elias. Thank you. It's, it's so an nice an to have you. Such an honor. Tell us about here. where you're from and your mm, Mexico, Mexico City. Yeah. Mexico City Basin Watershed. It's, it's such an, a beautiful, beautiful place. It's in the Trans-Mexican Neovolcanic Axis, okay. which is the only mountain range that crosses the Americas east to west. The Mexica liked to refer to it as the belly button or the heart of the world. And it is also called Anahuac, the Anahuac region. Anahuac means close or near to the water at 2,240 meters above sea level. All so, that height. So yeah. it's really high up, but it's close enough to the equator that we like to say we have the perfect climate year round. It's one of the most beautiful places. And you know, when... Hernán Cortés, the Spanish conquistador, came into the, the basin. He said, it's the Venice of the Americas. It was full of canals, and it was, as Charles E. Mann also describes it in his work, it was a culturally created landscape mm -hmm. by people managing the abundance of water. So it wasn't had. a wilderness that thin man came into. It was created by man coexisting with this complex Absolutely. system. Okay, and, and we can go back... Uh, maybe two, three thousand years before that to the Xochimilcas, which invented the Chinampa system, which I'm, I'm sure you visited in Xochimilco, which is this, these uh, capillary irrigated islands that grow food like four season, four times a year. So it's a highly abundant system, which gathers very rich soil you could get because of the volcanic axis and the abundance of water, and it's a closed basin. Mm -hmm. So ev it, whatever happens in Mexico City kind of stays in Mexico City. Yeah? So good things and bad things. So the history is of, you know, people messing it up in different ways. Um, Cuenca, this is, uh, what are we looking at here? Well, watershed for us, and um, sparking off our, our, our work with Regenesis, with Tim, and Tim Murphy and Ben Haggard, watershed is, is our way of understanding a biological system that we can engage with and, and really work at that level as much as complex as it could be, but as a, as a thought experiment as well, is understanding how a watershed has evolved through time. And we're seeing its evolution from 1350 to 1850. See, uh, when, you, when the conquest happened, The, the, the infrastructure that separated the fresh lake from the salty lake and the distribution of all the monsoons that we got was, mm. was, was torn apart. All right. So the city flooded continuously. Right. The capital of Spain was actually moved to Puebla for a time, for yeah. like a hundred and some years, yes. until we made the Tajo de Nochistongo, which is a draining the swamp, quite literally. Yeah. And, well, Mexico City now occupies the entirety of the basin. Basically. So what we're looking at there is what used to be a watershed uh, in sort of pristine condition. Like five, with hundreds of years yeah. of intervention by people, uh, particularly after the Spanish came. Okay. Yeah. And that's the, your space today. That's your main principal activity area. One of our main areas of focus. I, I love Mexico City mm -hmm. and I, I truly believe that that bringing in about, and I mean, our, our work without Thomas Filsinger to inspire us on what it was, you know, I mean, these were some gavions that were like, 
kilometers, miles long. What is a gavion? The, uh, these are uh, like uh, dams. Yes. Like we were like beavers there. We right. made some dams, albaradones, they were called, that pivoted and made the whole five lake system be able to be connected. But you can imagine, I mean, in architecture school, John, they always told me the Romans knew their water infrastructure. Netzahualcoyotl and the Mexica people really, really knew their water. I mean, this is a, a very intricately managed landscape in, in terms of also to feed the Aztec Empire. Yes. You know, I mean, this is the, the, the basis of the Aztec Empire, we could say, is the ability of this ecosystem to grow an abundant amount of food. At some point, there were 45 rivers in the, this watershed, they, is that correct? Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and you know, John, as Jorge Legorreta, a dear friend and teacher, used to say, they are still there. Yeah. And we like to say, if you measure them meter by meter, most are not tubed. But the tubed, urban area... When were they tubed? 1942. Oh, really? The first one Recently. started yeah. with La Piedad River. Yes. And close off after the LA River started to be yeah. um, concreted. Yes, into channels and dammed waterways. And, and such, yes. because we, 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 we... How far is Mexico City from LA? Not so far, right? It's a three hour ride, yeah, three hour right. plane ride. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and this dynamic or this idea that nature is a machine that we will over engineer our way to control it is, as we have, as we have learned, not... Not so the did the, did the, the idea of putting the rivers into tubes come from Mexico or was it imported? It was imported from the military industrial complex in LA. Right. This is the first one that I, I've tracked is, is the first river to be... The role uh, the, the, the engineers, yeah. yes. Okay. Overly engineered, we could say. Yeah. LA is making efforts to bring its river back in, 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 in some ways. And, and Mexico City started, well, Mexico as a country started with Miguel Alemán. And Miguel Alemán did dams all across the country. What we, period are we talking about now? 50s. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So here we see what? This is the beginnings of an untubing. What we, what we learned from working with the regenerative development workshops at Ibero, at our university, and with the Regenesis group is the potential of daylighting rivers. And watching as well what they did in Cheng Yechon, in the Seul River, which, be it as it may, has enabled Seul to bring three rivers back more in, within the city. And it has also enabled them to take away 16 overpasses, which is... So this is what, what they did in Seoul not so long ago. Was yeah, to 2003? Is, yeah, I mean, there's this incredible weight of infrastructure with roads and overpasses has Two been lanes. taken away and has been, the river has replaced it. So the river, or, yeah, and the river has replaced it. And, and another beautiful example that has inspired us is the Manzanares River coming back in the center of Madrid. You see, there are connections that used to be made because it was interrupted by the highway that took 40 minutes. Now with a river, you'd walk eight minutes across the center of Madrid. And also it connects the center of Madrid with over 70 kilometers of river walks up and down basins. That weren't there, what, 15 years ago or 20 This years they ago. did, I believe, 2013, like yeah, right. maybe 10 yeah. years after Seoul. Yeah, yeah. And do you know, was this like an engineering project or a political project in Madrid? I think, I mean, our feeling is that Seoul is a political project, mm -hmm. which also had a dire maintenance for the overpasses that needed to take place. So they said it's easier to take away <laughs> right. than to fix. And, and the whole of the world is filled with crumbling overpasses. So many. So just take them away and then replace them bring with them, rivers. Bring the rivers okay. back. Right. Uh, That's where a simple you can. solution. Um, in Seoul, it was an academic project that turned political, and mm. the mayor then became president. He said, I built it. He was also uh, the CEO of the construction company that built the overpass. Uh, right. Oh, really? So he's taking down his own work. So, so he yeah. said, I built it. I can take it away. <laughs> the, the beauty of the Madrid project is that it's, it's, it's bigger. It's, it's, it has more uh, space to, to, to play, let's say. And, but 
this is a much more expensive project, John. Madrid was, I, I, I get like over four, like close to four million euros. And Seoul was 400. Yes, yes. The big difference here is that they tubed an expressway, the M30, I believe it's yeah, called, yeah. under it. So you have like a big dig type infrastructure similar to Boston, which is really expensive. And this was like most infrastructure in the world we know is, is conduced by a group in power mm. that have big machines to do stuff. And, and, they're and like, they can find the money magically when they need to. When, yes. when we, yeah. when, yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Take us to, uh, so this is the, some details of your first sort of major work in, in Mexico City. Yep. So we also like to say, John, that it's, it needs to be part of a strategy, right? Right. And mobility in Mexico City is, is, is part of the water, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's an in, intimately tied relationship. So if, if we are going to daylight a river, we also need to put a public transportation uh, we also need to put bike lanes we also need to talk about the local context and not not only uh, not, not only bringing nature back okay and this this idea was again born from academia but then it became a thing amongst uh, people in mexico city we became big we were interviewed for a couple of of things and ended up in the New York Times of all places. But the beauty of this is that we wanted to make something that would make it a reality. So, so it began as a story of what could be. Look, here is what it could be if we did a few interventions and then it became real a, a, over time. A, a very little part of it. Okay. A very well, little part. We deal in little parts is good because little things lead to more little things. Little things lead yeah. to. So is that what things. we're looking here? The ecoducto. The ecoducto is is the way of government saying, "Oh, we hear you. We're going to do a lineal park," mm -hmm. and then we revert back because they said, "Oh, we're going to put blue lights to remember the river," <laughs> and we're like, "Wait, wait, wait! Hold, great that you're going to do another park, but hold the blue lights." Let's put a wetland instead of that blue light. Was this a big controversy or did they say, okay, do that? It was. I mean, it was a controversy, but uh, there was a big um, hydrobiologist and his team supporting government in terms of the specifics of a wetland. Um, we were supporting government in terms of the communication, the branding, well, the concept. But also, we wanted to see this as a learning opportunity, as a lab as something that, that could is help this, us Is this train. what you call a green-blue corridor? Is that what I'm looking at here? It is a linear park, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we used to call it living system design, and then it became green-blue infrastructure. Okay. Now a lot of people, which I love the concept, like to say nature-based solutions. Uh, okay. Because Ecoducto grabs a sewer water, which flows right underneath it, and it treats it through a series of wetlands. This is actual city sewage coming through a actual. planted environment mm -hmm. and the water, where does the water end up? I irrigating the rest of the park. Okay. Yeah. Irrigating the, so it's a park that self irrigates itself through sewer water. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't want to put a solar uh, uh, pump, but it could be easily self sustaining with a solar pump to have it be um, gravity basically that the, the wetland goes that way and then comes back and then irrigates the rest so of is the this knowledge of which plants to use was did somebody already know that or did you have to test it all out that person right there dr alejandro alba the guy in standing in the middle of the uh, the, <laughs> the, the wetland. wetland he's a hydrobiologist okay when he he taught us so so much stuff on the specifics of wetlands Cuando empezamos a, antes era puro pasto, teníamos cuatro diferentes tipos de aves. Ahora ya tenemos alrededor de 17 diferentes tipos de aves que ya están tomando el, el ecosistema. ¿Por qué? Porque ya hay disponibilidad de alimento. Como tenemos un ecosistema acuático, casi todas las plantas se trajeron de Xochimilco. Entonces, al traerlas también traíamos a las especies que estaban habitando ahí. Y estas empiezan a poblar otra vez la zona que antes era de ellos. Wetlands or living machines are nature's way of, of the ecotone of how they treat, but it's, we have learned one of the best ways of treating sewer water. They're, they're 
relatively cheap to build. Right. They require space, but that space can become a park. They, and we have biodiversity. We have, How long is this uh, in this Lydia Park with the... It's a uh, 1.6 kilometers. Okay, it's, so that sounds like quite big to me, yes, okay. It's 1.6 so, uh, kilometers and I mean the, the testing of, of the water has been... So this well, it goes in like, this is what, and then 1.6 kilometers later it's clean no, water. No, no, a lot less. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the actual wetland, the, the hard work, the wetland that does the hard work is, is 250 meters. Really? Yeah. So all Linearly. those plants eat the whatever you call them, uh, the brown stuff in the water. <laughs> uh, Ecoli. And, yeah, yeah. I have learned that wetlands can treat heavy metals, can treat, uh, how you say, anticonceptivos. Um, contraceptives. Contraceptives. Yeah. It can treat, obviously, sewer water. Yeah. And what I also like to point out is the true heroes of this story, John, are the microorganisms. Yeah. We're doing all of that just to put up the sufficient structure of rocks and plants so that microorganisms can come in and they do the real because work. Because one of the reasons that people blocked, you know, concreted over rivers in the past was in the interest of hygiene. Well, smell, but also then they and decided hygiene. that smell and yeah. the kind of organic smells were indications of danger and disease. Absolutely. And then how was that a an issue to be dealt with in Mexico City when you introduce that? People say, hey, come, you can't do that, it'll be diseased. There is a big thought, uh, misconception, we could say, that wetlands smell badly. Uh, they do not. Uh, maybe when, uh, at the point where you are getting the sewer water, but that can be solved with uh, ventilation tubes. Uh, the park does not smell bad at all. Yeah. Um, but also, it carries another 14 liters per second under it that still are not treated, you know? So, but uh, we've made the math with one of, a brilliant engineer in Mexico from Israel called Shalom. And he says that we don't need more than 5,000 square meters of, of a wetland to treat the, the whole amount of water. So, right. <laughs> so these are really solvable issues if we, if we go to nature and, and, and apply nature-based solutions in the good There way. is a huge infrastructure of people and industries doing hard uh, sewage management, so they have to be persuaded to evolve quickly towards this more ecological approach. Absolutely. 80% of activated mud treatment plants in Mexico are just off. Mm -hmm. They're just white elephants, we like to say, because they spend a lot of money, which is overly more expensive than wetlands. And what we always love to do, John, is, is put a topographic map to remind us of the watershed, where we are, how it was, the lakes, and casually pointing to what has made our watersheds disappear. And another way to move things forward has been in, in our last living river, which is south of Piedad River. It's called Magdalena River. This we learned uh, doing this project that it's privately owned, 111 hectare um, savior of Magdalena's upper watershed because it's detaining the rest of the urban fabric to come up and eat the rest of Magdalena River. Uh, Magdalena River, that, that's actually where we visited with you and Tim. Yes, yes I remember a very memorable visit. Wild rivers right next to the center of the city. It's, it's extraordinary. crazy. Every person we go, it's like, wow. I can't believe this is here. So this accesso to what exactly? This is it's the, a natural uh, park yeah. that we were uh, commissioned to design. Uh, As part of this uh, watershed? Uh, of the Magdalena water, sub-watershed, we could say. It's one of the maybe easiest to handle because it has uh, 3,000 hectares above it of ejido, which is communal land. A little bad practices, we could say, of uh, monocultures or a bad man badly managed uh, cow, mm -hmm. and you know, which pollute the water. Which would pollute yeah. the water. There's informal settlements that drain their sewers in in a disorganized way, non treated way. So the, a natural park seemed to us the a, a very appropriate solution in terms of helping organize the commerce that is there, helping organize the sewers that arrive. In, 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 and in down to the city, you know? So when it says Zona 1, this is a bit like the wetlands you show us in the center of the city. A little bit. Same sort of... A little bigger. This, is a, this is a functional wetland. Absolutely. It's treating water. Treated it's not just decoration. Sewer. 
I I deeply believe in nature as beauty, but but as function, and and if if we intertwine them, we can we can make beautiful places that are functionally uh, related to human dynamics. So maybe in this way we could appreciate life a yes, little bit more. <laughs> maybe we could. I mean, we certainly can. And, and biodiversity, you know, these are our, our treatment plants that can bring about biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So this is, a, and, and that require gardening to, to keep maintenance, you know. And, and you does the knowledge soil. exist to uh, maintain such a park? Do you have to bring in people from outside or do local people have the, uh, the knowledge and the capability to do the maintenance? You know who maintains Ecoducto? No. These are the people... <laughs> These are the people that were left syndicalized by the last administration. Yep, yep. Because current administration says, oh, you know, I mean, I'm not going to maintain it. The last administration did it. So the person that I love to say, there is good people everywhere, even yeah. in the Mexican government. Ricardo Jaral left people syndicalized. What does syndicalized mean? Um, Syndicalized, uh, unionized. Okay, yeah, yeah. Unionized, and so the gardeners were trained by the biologist. Right. Okay. And, and so this to say, it's gardening. Mm -hmm. This is very, very simple gardening of weeding and and checking out how the different um, plants interact. You also have a nursery of plants where you continuously can take out plants for other wetlands. Constructed wetlands are, are one of the key key features for me. To and this is real. It's not just a, a kind of concept because it can be done. It, okay. It's yeah, the the world over. And is that a private house we're looking at? This there? is this is the project that we moved to Valle, mm -hmm. and the concept of. I mean, it is the same watershed in a way, but it's not. So it's a transbasin movement. Mexico City water. I'm explaining it all the way around to cut. Mexico City water, 40% of it comes from Valle de Bravo, mm. which is two watersheds across. So it's transbasin movement bringing water to Mexico City. Mm. It's a very abundant system. And during the pandemic, I, I, I started to question my work with big corporations like the one in this Cañada project or government and trying to work in a new way with communal landowners. We call them ejidatarios, mm -hmm. and this specific ejido, rincón, it's called, corner, is in the one of the corners of our Valle de Bravo watershed. Okay. So water is born here through springs, passes through the development we're doing. It's retained through key line design. So we. This we, is interventions that you do to modify the way the water is moving around the site or to get it back to where it was? To where you want it to be. Oh, uh, okay. In, in a very anthropocentric way, you yeah. could say, but it's also a, a way that you get water where you have a lot of yeah. and you channel it to where you need it or you have less of. So what we did here are some rain ponds, some rain gardens that help increase uh, biodiversity. Oh that help retain water. And the key line, what it also does is it helps spread out water, mm. not erode it, not erode the, the, the forest, but infiltrate slower. Okay. So yeah. we're, we're helping infiltrate a little bit more water through the rains in, in, in this little, I like to call edible, edible forest or a food for, habitable food forest. Okay. And what we're trying to also develop here is the idea that being, as we, you were mentioning, that I love the concept of part-time farmer. How can we be part-time farmers and get people excited about it? And I love the, the, the points of view during the workshop of Rich saying, every town needs wine. Yes. And we want to double down on that, but maybe it's not necessarily grape wine. This is honey wine, no? or honey beer, yeah. mead, that we're doing with wine, uh, honey from from this land is was, was the beekeeping there before already people it's part of the tradition but of the land there's a lot of beekeepers around yeah they sell honey at a certain amount yeah but this we are realizing could help them double or at least triple the value of their honey wow yeah and again it's producing biodiversity so this is in the edible food forest that we've been looking at mm -hmm. and this is the list of edible plants 
before and through time. Is that right? Jose, our partner there, let the forest grow back. The okay. forest there was cut because it managed corn and potatoes and peas. Okay. Jose let it grow back kind of naturally. So we got another 19 species coming back by natural succession. And then we worked with a hydrologist that I've loved working, Manuel Quintanilla, and he's helped us do an edible food forest. So how many different plants are there now? This is... Uh, uh, close to 100, 111. Uh, uh, and they are all growing in the food forest that we've been looking at. Okay. They're all growing in, in our food forest. And an, a habitable food forest also begs the question of what type of materials are we using to build, right? Okay. So we want to use local source materials. We want to use... Um, we're using plasters that are natural plasters. We're using pine locally and burning it with the sugiban technique, which I love, the burnt wood technique that Japanese and I later learned Amazonian people use. <laughs> right, yeah. And the natural plaster, tadelak, is one of the most beautiful finishes you can do. So it's, um, I don't know how you say in English, nopal. It's a cactus. Yes. Um, it's a, that is very gooey. Yeah. And a couple of other stones, alhambra, and to make black tadelak that we use here, we use a little obsidian powder. And it ends up being this beautiful texture that is really so cool. And it's made with... with local materials. Local materials. Beautiful. Local materials. This is, this is what I believe connects us to the watershed. And what I, 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 I moved there, try, worked there because I was trying to run away from activism. Right. And I couldn't. <laughs> uh, friends of ours that are... I always like to say that the señoras will save the world. They are a group of three people that I'm thinking specifically that they came up to me and said, government is destroying a river down in Valle mm -hmm. with the car infrastructure. It's like, not again. But they follow us everywhere, you know? And it's this idea that a bridge for cars will solve everything. Yeah. And and I'm in upper watershed. This, in, in essence... In, in reality, you could say it does not impact me. The traffic down in Valle, I don't... But, but we do have to realize the impact of, of not having a healthy watershed for all. So the car infrastructure that they want to build that really doesn't solve mobility ended up killing one of our cloud forest rivers called Los Alamos. So we this got... Is, the back. old system kind of, you know, not yet dead, uh, still does these destructive ecocidal things. Uh, and what has your response to that been? What we're, are we looking at here? We're trying, we, we, we signed a, a convenio. Mm -hmm. How you say? Um, we signed an agreement between yeah. a state and local governments right. of them forced to uh, heal the ravine. They, they were also sued by a couple of governmental federal instances. And what, what we are really trying to solve here is mobility. Mm -hmm. Because... It's not truly solved. People go to Valle and move everywhere by car. Right. But the three urban centers of Valle are like walking in hipster land in Mexico City. It's 10 kilometers. Yeah, yeah. So in the 10 kilometers, you could easily do with a bike if you had the proper infrastructure. And this so you're basically back. proposing and developing an alternative infrastructure to big heavy roads in which multimodal active traveling uh, replaces heavy highways. And the idea that we can give space for all. This is, I think, the basis of, of good urban planning. No, not only giving space for cars and, and really not fighting cars because a complete street, like we, we, we call it in the urban lingo, is better for cars too. Since more people are moving towards bikes or to walking because proper infrastructure is there, complete streets are better for cars. And working in this, th these ideas was, was part now of the, of the agreement with government. It's like, well, you can't do all the complete streets, but at least start doing them. So Heal this the ravine is incidental. And so you're not trying to kind of put the whole river back in one go, but in, you know, inter, intervening in bits of the city, uh, bringing bits of the river. A complete street includes nature, in other words. That's Absolutely. The point. Yeah. Absolutely. It's the idea that well, you're bringing this ravine back that you killed, and then 
well, the car infrastructure is still going to go above it. Okay, but then yeah. we still have the mobility issue to solve. Right. So bringing proper sidewalks, universal access, and nature-based solutions to, to the main roads in Valle will make the main roads more, well... So safer you, for everybody to You start. don't have to, to, to propose badding cars, you just reduce the amount of space and circulation distributed to them. And it's, increase. it's a little diet. It's a little, you know, one of the, my favorite books you've recommended to me, uh, Lean Logic. Right, yes, fabulous right? book. Yeah. We could say Lean Streets. Yeah. And taking this idea back, it's, it's, it's people in, in, in urban lingo say road diet. Right. But but I want to change that and say car diet. Yeah. There's this, this map, Red Metropolitana, is the, the complete streets that you will make or have made. Where are we at now? The, the, working in these three urban centers in Valle gave us the idea of doing it the same way in Mexico City. Across this whole city. Mexico City is very bikeable. Yes. Most of it. And... Well, I'm not going to go into the potential of micro electric micromobility and all of that. So we started to propose a way to bring complete streets to Mexico City, because as you as you see in the green, most of infrastructure in Mexico City right now is on the on the on the west side, and that's all good maybe for me that I live there, you know. But my my neighborhood, John, has six hundred thousand people living in it, right. but receives five million people daily. Right. Yes. So this is a big. They all coming problem. to see you personally. You're in such demand. You have five million people right. saying, "I need to see Elias." Okay. We yeah. need work. We need to go and say, and but and yeah, or most movements are by public transportation, but mm -hmm. in reality, what we need to do is take this car diet more seriously less less than seven kilometers are easily made by a bike mm -hmm. and this is half the mm -hmm. car rides in mexico city so it's a dramatic potential so you're like facing one of the most car damaged cities in the world mm -hmm. owing to the last period of modernization that's coming to an end but there's a whole infrastructure of government and construction companies and car companies that can't let go but you're finding a way to transition the old infrastructure and the old ways of doing things. You're not saying you have to stop tomorrow, but it's a kind of transitional uh, concept. Okay. We can, we can, and, 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 and this is exactly how we're trying to, to, to go about this. It's saying, well, we've had, we have 500 plus kilometers done to knit a complete metropo uh, um, metropolitan network of complete streets. Let's do 100 kilometers a year, which is something that we've been maybe even doing hmm. up to now. So let's just connect the, the part where the city needs connecting and not just make, a, make cycle lanes where, where and this high is, income this is areas a, This are. is a complete street, a kind of overview of all the elements that can coexist and do coexist now when you have, and you've done this for six, 700 kilometers of streets. Not all of them maybe are completely complete. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, some have uh, pollinators, some have, uh, some have plant pollinators, some have uh, transportation. Not all complete streets need a confined bus lane. Okay. No, a complete street, has, as, our, as we're calling it right now, has four subsystems interacting with it. Okay. Nature-based solutions yep. in, in a variety of ways universal access with with its different elements systems of mobility and public making or connecting public space okay. which traditionally a complete street used to say it's for individual alternative private and massive right right transportation so yes it's mobility but it's also nature mm -hmm. it universal access because we all deserve good streets mm -hmm. and and the idea of public space but this takes us back to the river. This, for me, is our simplest way of saying a street with nature in it leads to an avenue with a river in it. Uh, no? so, or a river with an avenue in it. Yes. Or a river with an avenue next to it or underneath it. Or underneath yes. it. Okay. Somewhere I mean, else, yes. 
we, we need to include nature in every, in every street. So these are the different scales in which you're in practice bringing nature into the city, from you know, the individual house, the street, the city and the watershed. Um, and that's coexisting. These interventions happen at the same time. Absolutely. It's not one after another. It's not a linear process. And it's it's multitudes of interventions that absolutely. coexist. It's, it's, it's multitudes and it's a variety of elements that can happen at different scales. Mm -hmm. and, and we're trying to emulate how life works as well, which is by nested systems. So this is when one's bigger systems at different scales and different types coexist within each other and help each other and uh, do all that, yes. It, 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 as, as, as we love to say, interdependency, interrelation, interrelationships, interdependencies. And, and we also need, my, my feeling is we need to give people anywhere the means to start doing something. Right. Yeah, yeah. So this is for me a way of saying, well, you have your house, you can do water harvesting, you could mm -hmm. do a horticulture garden, mm -hmm. you could do a little wetland for your own drainage, you could have a biodigester. You could put solar, mm -hmm. you could put clean energy, you can do a, build with a, a non-fossil, local, clean materials. As you, saw, as you showed us before, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and where are we going to get the space for all of this? No? And for me, we, we come, come back again with, with, with the proper diet. You know, and I, I don't believe in like big dramatic diets. I believe in healthy diets. And I, I don't want to fight cars, I believe Cars are at some point a great invention, and we love, we, we maybe even need them to go some places. Yeah. But, but not to dominate the whole narrative. Of but the city. not to dominate the narrative. Yeah. I yeah. love these images that say arrogance of space and that put all the amount of space we give to cars. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I love metaphors, and the, the, the current one I'm playing with is like a, a, a city designed based on cars, it's like a diet based on bacon. Some people probably would like that, but anyway, that's a separate, but it's otherwise very bad for you and bad for the pigs and bad for the bad, planet. Bad, but yeah. a little, maybe a little, little bacon, bacon. Yeah. maybe a little bacon from a very well... I think a lot of people watching this will be quite pleased to think there'll be a little bacon. A little bacon. Even if this it's, is what it's I'm a saying. secret they have, a guilty this secret. This is what I'm saying. Yeah. We, we don't need to be uh, purists. No. no. We don't need to be radical. No. Well, at some points we may, but I think the the the, the cumulative effect can, can be and is radical, but we don't kind of confront people with radical change without any preparation or any kind of journey through this, the transition. The war on cars. Eh. No. Eh. No. I don't believe it's it's maybe the even the proper framing. We we need to get people that love their cars to say you know. Well, I a lot of poor people, too. disadvantaged people, rely on cars more than wealthy people who have lots of other ways of getting around. Mm -hmm. So that if a war on cars without any qualification is a war on the poor in many cases. Mm -hmm. And so that's something we need to be conscious of when we make people like me who say, get rid of all the cars, which I would love to do. But then, you know, what happens to all the people who can't move to their work or take their children to school or whatever? I, 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 I love to say that, um, quote Star Wars in, in one of my quotes, that say, only a Sith deals in absolutes. Yeah, right. So it's not about absolutes. No. It's, it's about an integra a deep integration of multiple different things. Mm -hmm. And what we're playing on right now, because I've been asked to, well, how do I drink this? You know, how do I play with it, literally? So we're developing this toolkit, yeah. we could call it, uh, that turned into what we hope could be an educational conversation building game so we're going to finish on that in a, in a minute of the, the this has just been introduced uh by elias and his uh, colleagues as a prototype if, am mm -hmm. i right yeah. and tell me what i'm holding it's a working prototype yeah of uh, the toolkit us playing with this notion of complete streets and and guiding people through through a series of questions yes and a series of graphics that can point you to, ah, how does my street work, or what type of street am I living in, or I want, or we want to work on. And we uh, designed the elements based on these four subsystems, no? Yeah. Uh, public, public space, universal access, nature-based solutions. And attached to the booklet are these cards, mm -hmm. so that when we talk about 
it's not about a global war on cars instantly. There's lots of different ways of <coughs> moving from where we are to a complete street. And these are all the multitudes, you know, hundreds of uh, small and large scale interventions mm -hmm. that one can take. And the game uh -huh. is you can do them in lots of different combinations. It, yeah. You can play a normal card game yeah. or you could go out to the street and say, oh, wow, well, maybe a skate park would work here. Or, yeah. or here we need a ascend and descend bay or you know what? Why don't we put a wetland here? <laughs> a wetland could so work. So people well. are so into the game by saying, yeah, yeah, we'll have a wetland and then buy buy all the cars and everybody <laughs> wins. Someone can say, you know, a car can fit through here. Okay, we'll give some. Well, it can be an aqua car or an under, underwater car. You know, they, they, the cars can adapt. They don't have to be everything being that. Well, the electric bollards. Yes. Those are amazing. Those are good. We can put an, an electric bollard that'll permit ways to come in and out. Yeah. Because we, 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 if we do really value life, we need to find a space for cars, not let them roam free everywhere. Find a proper space for them. National parks for cars, where they can have a humane, live out their Play days. Play amongst themselves. Have fun together and not be badly treated. Without but, a leash. Yeah, with not, <laughs> and, but not, not reproducing. <laughs> and yes, it's been a delight. We'll put the information on the end of the video about all these things we talked about and, and where to get the, the, the toolkit. And uh, Elias, thank you so much for coming. And uh, it's been you. a pleasure and a privilege to talk to you. Such a pleasure and a treat. Do you want me to close with his little yes. poem? The, he has a, a well, some words. Well, no, it's, it's a yeah. poem. It's, it's how we start the book of inviting people on our intentions to love thy street. It says, why play street? Water, air, and the way we move through our daily life from place to place should be one of delight and joy for everyone. We shouldn't have to fight to have safe access to our daily destinations or natural rights. Life is fulfillment and fulfillment is health. We designed this game to ignite real change through gamified conversations that can enable systemic consciousness in the face of our urban realities and their obstacles. Better streets, make better neighborhoods, better cities, and hopefully a better planet. Your street belongs to you. Love thy street. Thank you. Thank you, Elias. Thank Love you, Ice Street. Such a pleasure. Nice.